sao nhá hàng cái bay luôn vậy à, 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 à. <cười> một em chim trắng bay ra solitary kind of like owls and eagles and all of those creatures they are going to be hunting alone and living alone everything they do is all by themselves Harris hawks are the exception because those food sources are so scarce out in the deserts they actually hunt in family groups kind of similar to a pack of wolves or a pride of lions in those groups they can take down prey about 10 times their size that's really advantageous and here's Ripley our Harris hawk now you will notice that Ripley flies oh, oh. very close um, to you guys. He is a very fun one yeah. to start off with because he does give you those really close encounter flights. Uh, oh. That is actually not something that we have trained him to do. That's something that he does all by himself. That's because they are uh, flight involves an awful lot of work. And a bird like a hawk can actually conserve some energy by flying very close to an object. Every time he flaps his wings, he's actually pushing that air down and whatever object he's flying very close to is pushing the air back up. So all of your heads are helping with me in his flight today. You guys are doing a fantastic job. I bet you didn't know there was going to be audience participation in our flight. Come on, you have to stage one more time, Ripley. Now, like I said, these birds are found in the southwest. 
Western United States, and then they can also be found down into Central America, parts of Mexico as well. You can actually find them in the very southern tip of California, although not all the way up here in the Central Valley. That was some terrific flying there by Ripley. If you guys want to come on in and find a seat, you are welcome to. And again, that was Ripley, our Harris Hawk, starting things off wonderfully. He did such a great job. Ripley, they applauded for you. You can head out now, anytime. Now the way that we train our birds here at the zoo is that when they do something we've asked them to do, they get a really big prize. So Ripley was probably just waiting for a minute, savoring all of that tasty snacks that he knows he's going to get as soon as he goes home. Well, the next bird that we are going to meet is also a meat-eating bird. He's a carnivore, just like Ripley. But unlike Ripley, he's actually not a predator. He's not going to be hunting for his meal. Instead, he's going to be soaring around those skies, looking for things that are already dead to snack on. That's because this bird is a scavenger, and he's a very specialized kind of scavenger called a carrion eater. Carrion is simply a polite word for dead stuff. He's cruising around in the sky looking for all that dead stuff to snack on. And this bird can actually eat animals that have died from really contagious and deadly diseases like bubonic plague and anthrax and completely remove those diseases from the environment. So we all owe this bird a big thank you as he makes his way out here. But before he does come out here, I'll let you know that his name is Beetlejuice. It's a really good name, and we are going to be summoning Beetlejuice in the traditional manner by saying, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. So I won't say it a third time because we're not quite ready. Who knows what would happen then. But I will need everyone's help. So on the count of three, you guys are going to help me by saying Beetlejuice three times in a row, nice and loud. But I'm going to join you in the audience so that Beetlejuice flies a little bit closer to everyone. You guys all ready? Yeah. All right. On the count of three, one, two, three. Beetlejuice! 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 Let's see if it works. Now Beetlejuice got his name because when he first hatched, he had white wispy feathers on top of his head, and he reminded the keepers of the time of that Beetlejuice character. You will see he now has the characteristically bald head and neck that we associate with vultures. And that bald head and neck is actually a feature, not a bug. It is really important for vultures because as they're eating all of that carrion, sometimes that rotting, decomposing carcasses, can get a little bit gooey or sticky. Having a bald head and neck enables Beetlejuice to clean his head off on the ground as soon as he's done with his meal. And that way, none of the feathers that allow him to be more nice and get the fall will cause upper impact to him. Terrific job, Beetlejuice. Now, Beetlejuice is a black vulture. They're found in the southeastern United States, Texas, and Florida. And then they're also found down into the Caribbean. But around here, you will find turkey vultures. And if you go a little bit of exploring, you'll also find a really wonderful species called the California condor. Now in 1986, there were only 22 California condors on the entire planet. That is not a lot of individual birds. Every single one of those California condors was brought into human care as a part of the breeding and reintroduction program. And it was really successful. Today, any of us could travel about an hour and a half away towards Pinnacles National Park or Big Sur. We'd be pretty likely to get to see a wild California condor today. That's because from that 22 founder population, there are now over 500 California condors. And that is largely possible because <coughs> you guys came to the zoo. Every time you come to the zoo, when you go to an AZA accredited aquarium, any of these conservation places that you come to, that is where the money for doing all of those conservation projects comes from. So you're making a really big difference just by buying your popcorn or spending your time here with us today, helping those wild animals to get back out there into the wild and helping to preserve their habitat for future generations as well. Give yourselves a really big round of applause because you definitely deserve it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Well, the next bird we're going to meet is a little bit of a different type of creature. She's going to be showing off a really unique hunting strategy. We are going to be meeting a red-legged Sariyama, and her name is Victoria. Now, Victoria is an omnivore. That means that she eats things on both the meat and the veggie side of the menu. 
And one of her very oh, favorite foods that. happens to be things oh, like that. <laughs> Now this is a fake lizard, I will assure you of that before she gets started here. <laughs> oh. When Victoria finds a it? meal, what she does is she takes that meal, that prey item, and she actually breaks it apart on a really go hard out. surface. Like a oh, this is a natural smacking behavior that she does to pulverize those oh. insides because unlike us, birds don't have convenient teeth to help them <laughs> chew their meal. They have to figure out a different strategy instead. She's going to take that food item and whack it against that hard surface several times. Once those bones and organs are all mixed and broken up and she's able to swallow it whole, she'll go ahead and do that. But let's say that food item is still just a little bit too big for her to handle. She does have a very sharp talon on the back of her foot that will help her to tear apart that meal item a little bit further. <laughs> Now, red-legged Sariyama, like Victoria, is found in South America. And they are not the only birds that have this kind of unique hunting strategy. Oh. <laughs> Some other birds that use this strategy would be birds like kookaburras and other animals that use those. Uh, they're hunting their prey, but they don't have any of those sharp tearing talons like Ripley the raptor did. And they also don't have that really sharp tearing beak like Beetlejuice the vulture did. Great job, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if she can show off one or two really good snacks for you here. And then I think that lizard is just about done. Now I will tell you that no lizards were harmed in the training of this behavior. It is a natural behavior that she does all by herself. You might notice that I'm throwing little pieces of food on that rock whenever she has a really successful snack. <laughs> and that's because being a rubber lizard, this lizard is never going to turn into a delicious meal for her. If she were to do this natural behavior over and over and over again and nothing were ever to happen, <laughs> eventually she might start to get frustrated and stop demonstrating for all of you. Victoria, the bad news is your lizard ran away today. You did a great job demonstrating though. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. All right, well, she did wonderfully, but you know, I must say, she does like to eat the Mises pieces, which is not my favorite thing to have all over my hands, so I think I'll go ahead and wipe off my hands real fast before we move on. The next birds that we are going to be meeting are birds from the rainforests of the world, and rainforests are wonderful places because they bring us all sorts of things. Things like fresh food and water come from the rainforest, different medicine, all sorts of resources, coffee and chocolate. But they also bring us wonderful little birds called parrots. Now Frankie and Sam, who you saw at the very start, are two of those types of parrots. They're cockatoos. The next types of parrots that we will be meeting are Amazons. Our parrots are herbivores, they mostly eat veggies, so I am going to wipe off my hands real fast. Um, I thought I had a paper towel out here. Did anyone see what happened to it? It went in the trash. Oh, well that's not very helpful. Is there anyone back there that could run a second paper towel out for me real fast? Sorry guys, this will just take a second. Alex, do you have anything that I could use just to wipe my hands off so the parrots don't get their food all yucky? Uh, thank you, Alex. Oh. This is Alex. He's an African white oh. raven. You deserve it. <laughs> Alex happens to be one of my favorite co-workers, and his sister Izzy was actually out here at the very start of the show. We probably dropped her paper towel on the ground, so she made sure that it ended up in the responsible place in the trash can. That's one of those super easy things that we can all do to help animals making sure that none of that litter ends up uh, causing problems for them out there. All right, well, I actually forgot somebody. We get to meet another really big bird before we move on to those parrots. We are going to meet an East African crowned crane. Her name is Sarah, and as she joins us, if you feel the urge to duck, that is a survival instinct. Go ahead and duck. Now, as Sarah joins us, you will see that that name, East African crowned crane, tells you an awful lot about these birds. They are found in Eastern Africa, but the crown is that 
beautiful tuft of feathers that is right on top of her head. Those are simply modified feathers that have a slight, slight twist in them to cause them to stand upright. We really do not know why she has those feathers on top of her head, but she is an omnivore and she spent a lot of time out on the African savannas looking for things like grasses, grains, and seeds, but also hunting small prey like little lizards, maybe an amphibian or a small rodent. Now, as she's looking for all of those food items, that crown of feathers on her top of her head may help her to camouflage. They may help her to blend into her environment so that she's not quite so vulnerable to predators. But the other theory is that it might help her to stick out. Those feathers do stand up, up, uh, up above the grass a little bit, and so it's possible that they help East African crown cranes to identify each other in their flocks. They are very social, and they do live in relatively large flocks out there on the African savannas. Beautiful Aww. flying, Sarah. <laughs> Now, if you happen to be sitting very close to Sarah's flight path, oh, you might have heard a little bit of a squeaking sound as she flew by. That actually was not a noise that she was choosing to make. That is simply the sound of the wind passing through her feathers. Sounds a little bit like a squeaky door hinge. Now, one more fun thing for you to learn about Sarah is that she has a really <laughs> unique strategy for communicating with the other members of her flock. <laughs> if Sarah's feeling some sort of really heightened oh, emotion, if she's excited or nervous, she will actually start to flush blood into these white cheek <laughs> patches on either side of her face. They're going to start to turn kind of a bright pink <laughs> all the way to a dark red, and that will let the other members of her flock know something big is going on. It's kind of like a bird's version of smiling or frowning to help communicate with the rest of the group. Sarah, you did a terrific job today. Thank you for joining us. That was Sarah, the East African Crown Crane. Now we can move to those crane forests and we can meet that uh, yellow naped Amazon parrot who will be showing off a really different type of behavior yet again. She is going to be showing off what parrots are probably the most famous for, which is their ability to mimic. Now parrots are kind of well known for having an ability to talk, but they can't actually talk like you and I can talk. They don't know what the words they're saying mean. Instead, they hear sounds in their environment that they like and they want to hear over and over again. And they say, hey, we can make those sounds happen over and over again. And they simply repeat them so that they can hear them whenever they would like to. Well, we do have one very talented mimic here at the Bird Show. Her name is Gabby, and she'll be joining us in just a moment here. She is a yellow-naped Amazon parrot. Hello, Gabby. Now, these birds are found in Central America up to Mexico. All right, Gabby, would you like to demonstrate some of those vocalizations for us? Do you want to say hello? Hello. 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 Now, Gabby here happened to grow up on a farm, and so she does some pretty good barnyard animal impressions. Could we hear your chicken? <laughs> that was a pretty good chicken. <laughs> what about your horse? <laughs> that was an even better horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, sometimes when you're on the farm, you will see a yeah, 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 that's good news when you're a bird. Gabby, did you see a cat? <coughs> you thought you saw a cat. Meow. Yeah, young meow. And last but not least, Gabby here is very musical. She has been working on perfecting her very own song for about 30 years. She's really proud of it, so I hope you guys are ready for a concert. <laughs> Gabby, your song. <laughs> <laughs> they really like that song today, Gabby. Now, Gabby here is very charming, and she is demonstrating some of the more desirable noises that parrots can make. But the vast majority of parrots are never going to choose to mimic human speech in their entire lives. Instead, the one sound that you are guaranteed to hear out of a parrot is a really loud screaming sound. Now that sounds actually really important because parrots live in such dense rainforests that they can't always see the other members of their flock. This is Chloe, a blue and gold macaw, who is joining us over here on my right. 
Uh -huh. Now that his parents are in that really dense rainforest and they can't see each other, they're still oh, social creatures cool. and they want to hang out together. But okay. they do that by screaming to each other. That also means that if you have a parrot in your home, well, you've become that parrot's best friend. And so if you put that parrot into a room and you close the door to that room, they're going to want to stay in touch with you. They're going to start screaming to you. can start at dawn, go until dusk. And if you're very lucky, maybe your parrot will miss you all night long. So they'll scream to you through the night as well. Excellent demonstration, Chloe. All right, Kathy, shall we hear some of those more desirable noises one more time? Shall we hear your chicken? Pretty good. What about that horse? <laughs> yeah, that was a horse. Did you see the cat? You thought you saw the cat. All right, this one is my favorite. Can we hear that song? Thank you very much, Gabby. Goodbye, Nay. Goodbye, Nay. Terrific job, Gabby. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. And again, this is Chloe, a blue and gold yeah. macaw. These parrots are found in South America. Now, a little bird like Chloe, they're only going to live to be about 50 to 60 years old. But a big bird like Chloe here can actually live to be about 70 or 80 years old. That's another reason why we really just don't advocate them as the best pets for yeah, the average pet owner. <laughs> Some people have said it's a little bit like having a three to five year old for 70 to 80 years. So, you know, the parents in the crowd have something to think about with that one. Gabby, uh, you're welcome to head home any moment now. You did great. All right, well, it looks like we will have Gabby joining us to wrap up today's show. That's kind of fun. <laughs> we are going to have a few more birds joining us at the very end of the show as well. So if you would like to come on down, see them up close, or ask any questions, we definitely encourage you to come on down and do that. We are also going to have a very special opportunity for you to contribute to conservation a little bit further. As I mentioned before with that California condor reintroduction, you guys are a really important part of that conservation success story just by spending a few hours here at the zoo today. But if you wish to donate further, we will actually have a parrot that will be taking donations in the form of dollar bills. And 100% of those donations go directly towards helping those critically endangered species out there. Local species like the California condor, as well as species in far off parts of the world, lions, orangutans, rhinoceros, all sorts of creatures. This is Rocky, a scarlet macaw, and Kyler is helping him over there. They will be taking your donations, and if you wish to donate, please make sure that you have an adult accompanying you, and line up right along this rope. Rocky likes his dollars in a specific way. Kyler will help you out with that. All right, Chloe, you ready to give everyone a wave goodbye? Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.